Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Friday, March 29, 2024. The Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell says today's inflation report is pretty much in line with our expectation, but the Fed is looking for more good reports before deciding whether to cut interest rates. Maryland Governor Wes Moore gives an update on the recovery from the key bridge collapse. Environmental Protection Agency sets new tighter emission standards for heavy-duty trucks, buses, and other large vehicles. We'll talk about it with Politico energy reporter Alex Guillen. It's the one-year anniversary of Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich's arrest and detention in Russia on espionage charges. The U.S. government has labeled him wrongfully detained. President Biden and the bipartisan leaders of the House and Senate, among those today calling for his immediate release. A wreath-laying ceremony at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington on this National Vietnam War Veterans Day. And actor and activist Louis Gossett Jr. has died. We'll go into C-SPAN's video library and hear what he had to say about one of his first trips to Hollywood in the 1960s when he encountered racism with police who handcuffed him to a tree. Story from CNN. The latest U.S. inflation report showed that rising prices continue to weigh on American consumers. The Federal Reserve's preferred inflation gauge, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, was up 2.5 percent for the 12 months that ended in February, a faster pace than January's 2.4 percent rise in prices. However, it was in line with fact set consensus estimates. Driving the increase in the annual inflation rate was a 2.3 percent jump last month in energy prices. The Commerce Department's Data released Friday means the Fed is even further from achieving its goal of 2% inflation. But the report also contains some welcome news. Central bankers will likely take some solace in the core PCE index that excludes energy and food. That index slowed slightly to 2.8% from the 2.9% annual rate seen in January. That was from CNN. The Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell was interviewed today by Marketplace host and senior editor Kai Rizdal at the Federal Reserve Bank Conference in San Francisco. So I'm going to jump right in with the data of the morning. PCE came out this morning. You had it yesterday, 2.8% at the core. Here's my question. You saw it yesterday. What was your first thought? My first thought was that uh, the the report that uh, came out this morning is pretty much in line with our expectations. Uh, So Core PCE, as you mentioned, is at 2.8% on a 12-month basis. Mm-hmm. Headline is at 2.5%. That's what we were expecting. And it's, it's good to see something coming in in line with expectations. So as you and, and your colleagues uh, at the Fed and, and at the regional uh, banks have been saying, we want more data, more good data. Is this that? Is this in that bucket? Well, um, so... Uh, Let's take a step back. Over the course of the, of the second half of last year, we got what I would definitely consider good data right. uh, over the course of seven months. And uh, uh, then in January of this year, we got a very high reading, uh, much higher mm-hmm. reading on inflation. And so February is lower, but it's not as low as most of the good readings we got in the second half of last year. But it's definitely more along the lines of what we want to see. What we, so what we've said is that we, we don't see it as likely to be appropriate that we would begin to reduce uh, interest rates until the committee, the Federal Open Market Committee, is confident that inflation is moving down to 2% on a sustained basis. And what do we need to, to get that confidence? It's just more good inflation readings, like the ones we were getting last year. With all possible respect, you all all of you have been saying the same thing for now six months, right? We want more good data. What do you suppose it does to the listening public and to the professionals who are listening to this when you keep saying the same thing? So we're, you know, we, we're steady. Uh, our hand is a steady hand in this. We've been saying all through last year and this year that we're making progress. We, we've noted that progress. We haven't overreacted to it. We didn't overreact to the good data we had in the second half of last year. You heard us saying that this is good, but we need to see more. And, the, and, and you, you won't hear us overreacting to these two months that are higher. The reason that's important is that the decision to begin to reduce rates is a very, very important one because the risks are two-sided. If we, if we reduce rates too soon, there's a chance that inflation would pop back and we'd have to come back in, and that would be very disruptive. That would not be the, a good thing for the economy. There's also a risk that we would wait too long and that, that would, we would, uh, you know, in that case, it could be un, unnecessary, unneeded damage to the economy and perhaps the labor market. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell at a conference hosted by the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. 
Later in the discussion, he said he does not expect interest rates to go back to the near zero they were before the COVID-19 pandemic. Not to pick at a scab, but what I hear you saying is, uh, while inflation may or may not have been transitory, rates are not actually going to be transitory. They're going to be higher for a while, and they people might just be, need to get used to that. They, they, that might be the case. I don't know. I, I don't think late rates will go back to the very historically low right. levels that they were at before the pandemic hit. I do think uh, rates will come down from, are likely to be lower than they are, at least short-term rates are lower than they were right, right now. But, I mean, we're going to let the data, we're going to have to let the data tell us the answer to that. Fed Chair Jerome Powell. He also said growth is strong in the U.S. economy and there is no reason to think that we're close to a recession. The next Fed meeting is April 30th and May 1st. President Joe Biden posting on X this morning. We learned that core inflation in America is at the lowest level in nearly three years. The job's not done. That's why I'm taking on health care and housing costs, junk fees and corporate greed. But this is real progress. Wall Street today, the Dow up 47, Nasdaq down 20, S&P up 5. A story at Politico's e e News. The Biden administration rolled out another rulemaking central to its climate agenda with a regulation slashing pollution from heavy-duty trucks. Joining us now is Alex Ian, energy reporter with Politico. Thanks for being with us. What's changing here? So EPA is setting stronger um, emissions rules for heavy-duty vehicles, and this is everything from vocational vehicles like you see um, rolling around your neighborhood, school buses, garbage trucks, delivery vans, um, all the way on up through the massive 18-wheelers you see on highways hauling cargo long distance. Um, So it's addressing pollutants from a class of vehicles that is a relatively small part of the vehicles on the road, but produce an outsized amount of pollution, both because of how often they're used and because of their size and power. So um, EPA's rule sets new standards starting with 2027 model year and running through 2032 um, that get increasingly stringent. Um, And this is starting to push the trucking industry toward electric vehicles. The rule doesn't require electric vehicles. EPA says it can be met with other technologies. Um, But this Uh, is likely to, uh, you know, put more oomph into the push to electrify the trucking sector. Is there an estimate to how much this might cost and whether the cost will be passed on to consumers? Uh, Yes. So it does increase, it it is expected to increase um, some upfront costs for new purchases. And these purchases are already, you know, fairly expensive compared to the average passenger car. Um, But EPA says a couple of things. One, um, that uh, increased that the decreased fuel prices uh, from buying an electric vehicle or other types of vehicles um, are going to represent uh, lifetime fuel cost savings for owners. So um, essentially, charging with electricity is a lot cheaper than um, filling up with uh, diesel or another fossil fuel. Um, th- uh, this is also true, though, if they are just making um, diesel engines more efficient. Obviously, that comes with fuel as well. Um, the agency also pointed out that there are uh, tax credits available from the Inflation Reduction Act that um, can uh, put a big dent in the price of these vehicles up front. Um, that said, I have been hearing from the industry, the owner-operators industry group, um, and trucking groups that uh, they're not pleased with this. They don't, they, you know, they're opposed to big increases in upfront costs uh, because sometimes these trucks are being bought by um, individuals and not companies that have that kind of capital. So um, it is a bit of a balancing act, and uh, it would not surprise me to see some litigation on that point. We're talking with reporter Alex Gein from Politico. How has Congress been handling this, and, and has there been any early reaction from members of Congress, especially Republicans? Yes, there's been some criticism from Republicans. They um, are opposed to rules stre- strengthening this. They're, they're fairly well aligned with the truck owners on this issue. Um they may attempt to do uh, some legislation that would override the rule, but um, if that manages to pass Congress, uh, President Biden would surely veto it. Um, and so uh, that's uh, what's happening on Capitol Hill. Uh, one thing that you know that would be of note here is that if Donald Trump is reelected later this year, um, he could come in and, and claw this rule back and issue something different. Um, So uh, we've seen him do that before in his first term. He did that with other vehicle rules. Um, That could happen again here. And a question about that process. Is this a a final rule? 
Uh, yes, this is a final rule. So, um, uh, it, like I said, it does not start taking effect until model year 2027. And actually, for some classes of vehicle, not even until later, uh, some of the vehicle, uh, the, the, some of the heavy-duty vehicles this rule covers uh, won't have additional requirements until uh, as late as 2030. It just depends on the class. So um, uh, that'll be coming in the future. And a final question, again, a line from the Ian E. News article that this parallels updates that EPA made to its car rule earlier this month. How does this fit in? That's right. Uh, these are both important vehicle rules, uh, both a, an important part of President Biden's agenda to uh, decarbonize the transportation sector, which is the number one source of U.S. greenhouse gases. One of the reasons these rules parallel each other is that in both cases, uh, in the light duty vehicle rule last week and in the heavy duty vehicle rule we saw released today, um, EPA pushed back the more significant stringency increases to later in the program, so into the 2030s. Both proposals had originally envisioned um, a, um, a stronger jump in the stringency earlier on in the, in the late 2020s. Um, but in both cases, EPA sort of pushed that back a bit and, incre- and had the bigger stringency increases in the 2030s. Um, so what that does is it means that it gives automakers more time to um, develop and build out electric options on all classes of vehicles, um, as well as to uh, watch as charging infrastructure is built out, because it's also important. Alex Gian is an energy reporter for Politico. You can find his stories at politico.com and on X at Alex C. Gian. Thank you very much. Thank you. Associated Press reports that a crane appeared at the site of a collapsed highway bridge in Baltimore as crews prepared Friday to begin clearing wreckage that has stymied the search for four missing workers and blocked ships from entering or leaving the city's vital port. A crane that can lift 1,000 tons, described as the largest on the eastern seaboard, had been expected to arrive late Thursday, and a second that can lift 400 tons should arrive Saturday, officials said. They will be used to clear the channel of the twisted metal and concrete remnants of the Francis Scott Key Bridge, as well as the cargo ship that hit it this week. In total, four heavy lift cranes will be at the site by Monday, Governor Westmore told reporters Friday. He said in the following weeks, seven floating cranes, ten tugs, nine barges, eight salvage vessels, and five Coast Guard boats will be at the wreckage site to clear the channel as soon as possible. That was from Associated Press. Governor Westmore was joined at the news conference today at the Port of Baltimore by Congressman Kwaisi and Fume and representatives of the Coast Guard, Army Corps of Engineers, and the EPA. The governor, during his remarks, made some requests to the Maryland State Legislature. But to the members of the Maryland General Assembly... We know this. We are 10 days away from the conclusion of this legislative session, and there is a lot of work to do. The top priority in that work is going to be finalizing our budget. My administration proposed a responsible budget that makes important investments in housing and child care and environmental protection and transportation. So now it is vital that the House and the Senate find compromise as soon as possible, pass the budget, and provide certainty at this challenging and uncertain time. We also need to ensure that we pass legislation to support the families and the victims of the bridge collapse and everyone else who has been affected by this emergency. I will be proposing the creation of a permanent state scholarship for the children of surviving spouses of transportation workers who lost their lives on this job. We will continue to push for legislation that seeks to protect workers like the six victims of the Key Bridge collapse. I've also asked the General Assembly to ensure that any legislation we work on provides the flexibility our administration needs to support port workers, businesses, and our transportation network cannot possibly find every answer to every problem in the next few days before session ends, but we can give the state the ability to respond over the coming months. Fourth, on rebuilding. As I said yesterday, we cannot rebuild the bridge until we have cleared the wreckage. I've always believed that you never learn anything about anybody when times are easy. If you really want to understand someone's mettle, 
Watch them when it's hard. Watch them when it's difficult. Watch them when the stakes are high. Well, that time is now. And we are going to rise to meet this moment. Because we are Maryland tough and because we are Baltimore strong. Governor Wes Moore, Democrat from Maryland, at today's news conference at the port in Baltimore. He also said the recovery effort after the collapse of Baltimore's Key Bridge will take time. And he was asked about how long. He said, I can tell you it's not going to take days or weeks or months. This is going to take time. He was joined by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Baltimore District Commander, who said, I know right now everyone wants to see things moving. You need to know, you need to trust that behind the scenes, it's moving. This is Washington Today. Story from the Washington Post, President Biden's re-election campaign launched a digital ad Friday aimed at supporters of Nikki Haley, who dropped out of the race for the Republican presidential nomination this month. The ad is part of an effort by the president's team to win over Republican voters who may be disinclined to vote for Donald Trump. The Biden campaign, which is spending more than $1 million on the ad across digital platforms, will run the spot for three weeks in battleground states, campaign officials said. That was from the Washington Post. Here is the ad. Bird brain. I call it bird brain. Nikki Haley has made an unholy alliance with rhinos, never Trumpers, Americans for no prosperity. She's sitting there like... She's gone crazy. She's a very angry person. She is not presidential timber. I don't need votes. We have all the votes we need. She is... She's gone haywire. There aren't that many never Trumpers anymore. How do you bring these Nikki Haley voters back into the tent? I'm not sure we need too many. A digital ad released today by the Biden-Harris re-election campaign. The campaign by former President Donald Trump says that he will be holding a rally in Grand Rapids, Michigan next week on, quote, Biden's border bloodbath. Michigan Advance news site writes that he'll be seeking to highlight the death of a local woman authorities allege was murdered by her boyfriend who was in the country illegally. Washington Today continues in a moment. Hi there. I'm Jonathan from C-SPAN, along with my colleague, Ben. Since C-SPAN's founding 45 years ago, the media world has changed. Remember when there were just a few TV channels? Now we've got streaming, social media, apps, and more. Through all of this, C-SPAN has stayed true to its mission of giving you unfiltered access to government wherever you get your news. As we navigate this challenging media environment with fewer people subscribing to traditional cable packages, our funding has been impacted. That's why we're asking for your help to keep going strong for another 45 years. Please donate today at cspan.org slash donate. Your contribution, large or small, helps ensure at least another 45 years of witnessing democracy in action. Keep C-SPAN thriving in today's ever-changing media landscape. Visit cspan.org slash donate to make your gift today. Thank you. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast wherever you find your podcasts and on the C-SPAN Now mobile app. That app is free. Words of support from all corners of the U.S. government today for Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich. Today's the anniversary of his arrest in Russia on espionage charges. The Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, Democrat. Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican. House Speaker Mike Johnson, Republican. And House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, Democrat, releasing a joint statement that reads in part, We continue to condemn his baseless arrest, fabricated charges, and unjust imprisonment. 45 years ago, Evan's parents, Ella and Mikhail Gershkovich, found refuge in the United States after fleeing the Soviet Union. Today, Putin is restoring Soviet-style control through repression at home and aggression abroad. On the anniversary of Evan Gershkovich's captivity, we reaffirm the importance of his work. Journalism is not a crime, and reporters are not bargaining chips. And President Joe Biden out with a statement saying he's working every day to get him released. And, quote, journalism is not a crime. And Evan went to Russia to do his job as a reporter, risking his safety to shine the light of truth on Russia's brutal aggression against Ukraine. Today, the Wall Street Journal front page had a blank space with an image at the top of Evan Gershkovich and the headline, his story should be here. The president of the National Press Club, Emily Wilkins, who's the Washington correspondent for CNBC, posted this video. Hello. 
I'm Emily Wilkins, and I have the honor of serving as the 117th president of the National Press Club. One year ago today, Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich was on a work trip in Russia when security agents took him from a restaurant, detained him, and falsely accused him of espionage. The actions of the Russian government were jarring and unexpected. Evan was a fully credentialed to be in Russia and be reporting, and no American journalist has been held by Russia since the Cold War. Without Evan's reporting, we have lost insight into a country and a war where accurate information is desperately needed. Evan is the kind of reporter who was uniquely able to tell us about Russia, its politics, and its people. In our democracy, each citizen must be informed to fully participate. Our method of government relies on a public informed by a free and independent press. And when Russia jailed Evan, they put a little piece of who we are in that cell with him. We, the people, we need him back. And his family needs him back. Russia's issue is not with Evan and it is not with his family. We call on Russia to release Evan today. Send him home to his parents, Mikhail and Ella, and his sister, Danielle. And let's be clear here, it is up to our government to bring Evan home. President Biden, Secretary Blinken, and all whose job it is to protect citizens abroad and bring them home safe, you need to do better for journalists. Their families have the right to expect that their government will bring them home. Now is the time to make sure that Evan's unjust imprisonment is front and center. Wear your free Evan pins. Tweet about Evan with the hashtag I stand with Evan. Check out the Wall Street Journal's resources for social media and consider changing your profile picture on social media sites today. And if you're a reporter, ask about Evan and what is being done to bring him home. Hold our officials accountable. Ask follow-up questions. Make sure the U.S. government knows that we will not stop fighting for Evan's freedom and that of all journalists held hostage must be a priority. The 3,000 members of the National Press Club have sought to bring attention to Evan's case from the start, naming him our 2023 Obasham Press Freedom Honoree. And we invite you to stand with us in the fight to bring Evan home. Because journalism is not a crime. Emily Wilkins, the president of the National Press Club and Washington correspondent for CNBC, in a video she posted. Roger Karsten's special presidential envoy for hostage affairs was interviewed on CNN about the anniversary of Evan Gershkovich's arrest. The first question was why, earlier this week, the Russian court extended the pretrial detention. The reason for the extension, uh, we'll never really know. Uh, if you were to ask what I hope, I would hope that they're extending it to, so that we have another 90-day period in which to seek ways to come up with a deal that will bring both Evan and Paul Whelan home. Um, I can say that uh, uh, we've had seen in the past that when once a trial starts in Russia, the Russians will usually follow through. And so if the trial process starts with Evan, uh, that might take us into about a seven, eight, nine, ten month period where we may have a harder time trying to come up with a deal and make a deal to bring him home. So I think, uh, to my mind, I'm hopeful that the Russians are thinking that in the next 90 days they can work with us to, to come up with that deal that brings him home before the trial actually starts. But it's hard to get into their heads on this. Uh, when you say hopeful, are there any concrete um, discussions on what might unlock this, this, this crisis? I mean, for instance, clearly, I assume, given what we saw with Brittany Griner, what we've seen uh, with the case of the Iranian-Americans, there's always some kind of a swap. Well, who are they saying they want in return for Evan? Well, to get to the first part of your question, uh, we do have an open line or open channel with the Russians that we've been using to discuss these cases. It's the same channel that brought home Trevor Reed and Brittany Griner. Uh, we've been using it to discuss the return of Paul Whelan and Evan Gershkovitz. Uh, so there is an open communication that takes place between us. Uh, as you've probably heard before, we made what we felt was a strong offer last November to the Russians. The Russians rejected it. And in that time since then, we've been trying to come up with something else that the United States can pull together and deliver that the Russians will accept. Roger Carstens is the special presidential envoy for hostage affairs interviewed by CNN's Christian Amanpour. Secretary of State Antony Blinken tweeting today, Evan Grishkovich, a reporter who is only doing his job, has been wrongfully detained by Russia for a year. Russia should stop arbitrarily detaining individuals like him and Paul Whelan for political leverage. People are not bargaining chips. Evan, Paul, we will bring you home.
Today is National Vietnam War Veterans Day, honoring those who served in the U.S. Armed Forces from 1955 through 75. The holiday was created by an act of Congress in 2017. Army Major General Edward Crystal, Director, Vietnam War Commemoration, spoke at today's wreath-laying ceremony at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. In case you're wondering how March 29th was chosen, let me fill you in. March 29th, 1973, was a day that the U.S. Military Assistant Command, Vietnam, was disestablished. It was also the day the last combat troops departed Vietnam. Finally, it was the start of a seven-day period where Hanoi released the last prisoners of war. So you can see why March 29th is a considering con, is a you can see why March 29th is a fitting day to commemorate our Vietnam veterans and their family members. In our past National War Veteran National Vietnam War Veterans Day ceremonies, Gold Star family members have been paired with the senior officers and the senior enlisted leaders from each of our services of the armed forces. This year, we are privileged to have Vietnam veterans and the son of a Vietnam veteran all paired with a junior enlisted service member representing each service of the armed forces. These pairings specifically highlight Vietnam veterans paying tribute to their fallen comrade in arms. In addition, as we call our nation to remember and continue this sacred observance for years to come, it symbolizes the legacy of our Vietnam veterans passed down from generation to the next generation of our men and women in uniform. Finally, participating today, as I mentioned, is the son of a Vietnam veteran who is currently listed as unaccounted for to honor and remember the families of those who remain awaiting news of their loved ones. Today we have eight wreaths. Six represent the uniformed service branches, two represent the National Guard Bureau and our former prisoners of war and those unaccounted for from the Vietnam War. Major General Edward Crystal, director of the Vietnam War Commemoration at the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington today on this National Vietnam Veterans Holiday. The Veterans Department says over 8.7 million Americans served in the armed forces during the Vietnam era, 1964 to 73. More than 3.4 million were deployed to Southeast Asia, and approximately 2.7 million of those served in the Republic of Vietnam. Story from The Hill, former Vice President Al Gore lamented the rise of artificial insanity plaguing U.S. democracy while delivering a eulogy at the funeral of his one-time presidential running mate, former Senator Joe Lieberman of Connecticut. While offering condolences and comfort in light of Lieberman's death Wednesday, Gore on Friday warned about the rancor dividing the country and how his former running mate's life can serve as an example of how to overcome it. That from The Hill. The funeral was held at a synagogue in Stamford, Connecticut. Here's Al Gore with some lighter moments. I'm not on the program because I didn't know until midnight that I was going to speak today. Thank you, Matt. (laughs) And in fairness, the family didn't know I was going to, to use Matt's phrase, schlep up here from Tennessee (laughs) until uh, I got on the Delta flight in Nashville last night. You have short nights here in Stamford. Uh, <laughs> of Joe, we can say of him the very best we can say of any man. His was a life of constant consequence for his family, his friends, his nation. But I am standing here to tell a different story of praise. Joe was my dear friend. I knew him before he came to the Senate when he was Attorney General here in this state. I had always admired him in the Senate. We stood together on so many issues. Sometimes uh, in a small minority, he and I were among the only Democratic senators to support George H.W. Bush's decision to go into Iraq to force Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And I felt personally some of what Joe came to feel later in his career. 
We were close on climate, uh, on civil rights, human rights, women's rights, LGBTQ rights, and so many other issues. And so that closeness was formed before I chose him to be my running mate in 2000, but then our relationship and that between our families became extraordinarily close, a very significant relationship. We laughed together, fought like hell together for what we wanted our country to be, prayed together, thought for a season we had won together, but... <laughs> Well, you know that part of the story. You win some, you lose some, and then there's that little-known third category. But all of it drew us very, very close together. Al Gore at the funeral of Joe Lieberman today in Stanford, Connecticut. Congresswoman Maxine Waters, Democrat of California, posting on X, My dear friend Louis Gossett Jr. has passed away. Louis was a very talented artist who was the first African-American to receive an Academy Award for a supporting role. Of all the roles that he played, I believe an officer in The Gentleman was his very best. You are favorably recorded in history. Rest in peace, my dear friend. Louis Gossett Jr. was 87 years old. He also won an Emmy for his role in the TV miniseries Roots. In 2011, he was on C-SPAN on a panel at an NAACP convention talking about Hollywood and race. My uh, life started on Broadway, back in New York. I came from a neighborhood, a melting pot neighborhood, right after the Depression. So nobody had a whole lot of money, but we did have one another. So we grew up uh, pretty homogeneous. You know, we had stickball. We had the, the front part of a skate with the front part of the board and the back part. And we, we, did, we made uh, do. You know, we had three sewers with home runs, and we needed one another. Our heroes, of course, were all white except for Sugar Ray Robinson and people like that. But it really didn't matter during those particular days. It was a melting pot in Brooklyn. And if my parents didn't get home at five o'clock, I had a choice of gefilte fish, lasagna, corned beef and cabbage, and we were dumped into a bathtub regardless of who we belonged to. That was the kind of neighborhood that started my foundation. And as a result, when I got into schools, I was the president of a junior high school and high school, and they said, you know, you could be Superman Sunday. That's how I came into show business. Of course, I got slapped upside the face when the rest of the world wasn't like that. Hmm. So I was set at the age of 17 as an equal. And I didn't get the results of my first big movie was The Landlord, which I did with Pearl Bailey and Bo Bridges and Hal Ashby. That was an exception. My first reality check was in 1966 when I was handcuffed to trees here in Los Angeles for driving a Ford Fairlane, uh, 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 Fairlane 500 with the top down. It took me four and a half hours to get from Crescent Heights and Sunset to the Beverly Hills Hotel. Uh, I look at it in retrospect as something very funny today. And my first shot, which was wonderful, was that next day when I did the first movie of the week for Universal. So there was a, a sweet and sour kind of experience. So my first shot was for Lou Wasserman at the Universal, the very first movie of the week. But that same day, I got hit upside the face, if you would call it that, by being handcuffed to trees by the LAPD. It was a mix, mixed bag. And from then until today, I've had to deal with keeping my equality straight. Uh, I'll speak later on about the book, I'll tell you about it all. But I've had to swallow that hot coal and I know Harry, Harry can kind of, like, identify with the two realities and trying to get our reality up on that screen so that you can learn about ourselves. Louis Gossett Jr., actor and activist, in 2011 at an event in California hosted by the NAACP. He has died at the age of 87. That book that he mentioned was published in 2010, the memoir titled An Actor and a Gentleman. And in it, he recounted more about that story of police handcuffing him to the tree. He writes, though I understood that I had no choice but to put up with this abuse, it was a terrible way to be treated, a humiliating way to feel. I realized that this was happening because I was black and had been showing off with a fancy car, which in their view I had no right to be driving. Now I had come face to face with racism, and it was an ugly sight, but it was not going to destroy me.
Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Subscribe to C-SPAN's free evening newsletter word for word, and you'll get the stories making headlines in Washington sent to your inbox every day. Sign up at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night and weekend. Music.